Good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to the final conference of the Assess at Learning policy experimentation. I uh, would like to um, start with saying just that the Assess at Learning final conference is composed of three webinars. Uh, the first webinar today, which tells the Assess at Learning story, uh, what is digital formative assessment and what have we learned about it uh, during Assess at Learning. We have a second webinar on Wednesday, the 8th of February at 3 p.m. Central European time, entitled Bringing Different Voices Together and Learning from Them. And finally, a last webinar on Friday, the 10th of February at 3 p.m. Central European time too, looking at uh, what education actors need to get starting with digital formative assessment in schools, looking really at the tools and the processes. Now, before I uh, tell you what we're going to look at today in uh, this first webinar, um, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, and when I mean you, I mean you, the participants, because um, you are more than 300 today um, uh, with us. We have received more than 300 registrations. Um, and so we're keen to know you a little bit better. Um, so we have uh, uh, a question for you. What type of stakeholder are you? Now, you can respond to this question live by going to the website indicated on the slide and on the scrolling text on your screen www.menti.com, you enter the code that is shown on the screen and you can respond to the question. And at the end of the presentation, then we'll look at the composition of uh, all of you, the, the audience uh, that is with us today. So let's have a look at what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the context and the rationale um, in which the SS at Learning Policy Experimentation was created. We're going to provide an overview of the policy experimentation as a whole. Then we will listen and hear the results of the field trials. We will also look at the impact of digital formative assessment on students and the dialogue lab process, which we will explain later on. Uh, we will interpret the results uh, from a policy perspective, listening to partners from several countries. And we will also hear from you. As I mentioned, um, you're more than 300 uh, uh, participants with us today. So we're really looking forward to uh, uh, hearing from you on this topic. We have several speakers with us today. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome Patricia Vastio from European Schoolnet, Sonia Marzadro from the Research Institute for the Evaluation of Public Policies at the Bruno Kessler Foundation, Professor Janet Elwood from Queen's University, Belfast, United Kingdom, Professor Kay Livingstone from the University of Glasgow, also in the United Kingdom, Trin Saar from Estonia's Education and Youth Board, and Jakov Wurjo from the Finnish National Agency for Education. We also have with us today two chat moderators, uh, two colleagues from European Schoolnet, Antoine Bilgin and Milena Orvat. You can um, uh, interact with our chat moderators using the chat functionality which you have on the right-hand side of your screen. This is also the space where uh, you can uh, ask questions to speakers. And when we have uh, the question and answer session, then we'll pick a few questions as much as we can uh, and we'll relay them to the speakers. So without any further delay, I would like to welcome Patricia Vestio from European Schoolnet and she will explain the context and rationale in which the assessment learning experiment, policy experimentation was created. 
Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to tell you the, the story behind this project called uh, Assessed Learning, and in particular, the beginning of the story. And uh, it means we will see together what have been the reason why we enter into that uh, specific project focusing on formative uh, digital assessment. So I hope you see the slide on the screen now. Yes, OK, thank you. Um, so let's start with uh, answering this question, why European Schoolnet, who has been the coordinator of this project, focused on digital formative assessment. First of all, it's important to notice that uh, the remit of uh, European Schoolnet is to uh, analyze the conditions for digital and related social innovation in the education system to develop. Why social? Because as we all know and we observe, uh, technology is not just technology. It's also creating different type of role, different ways to build content and different ways to interact between learners and teachers. So one of the very important uh, improvement that technology could bring and can bring to education is, for example, developing personalized teaching and learning. And for that to happen, there is a need for starting from uh, a common basis, let's say, uh, to identify what are the differentiated needs and for that digital formative assessment, in particular the digital component that could help and facilitate development of solution, is, uh, is a focus point for European Schoolnet. A second characteristic of European Schoolnet is to um, develop projects and actions uh, a, that is evidence in form. So it's, it can be about policy, it can be about practice, but being grounded in result from research is an important component of, of what we do. And this is the reason why we, since the beginning uh, of the um, launch of uh, uh, Erasmus Plus and this opportunity to run policy experimentation, we are interested in uh, experiments, field trials, randomized sampling, um, test and control group, leading us to um, as much as possible quantitative uh, analysis that is as solid as possible. We are also interested in qualitative approach as a way to better understand, for example, the trends and the result coming from uh, quantitative analysis. And this is why in this project, we have both uh, tested an, an intervention that is a, a toolkit, the assessed learning toolkit in field trials. And we have also complemented uh, by organiz organizing dialogue lab in countries, giving an opportunity to all stakeholders to um, give their voice about what digital formative assessment takes to them, what it represents, how they perceive it. And the third aspect to mention is that uh, we always try to reconcile top-down and bottom-up approaches in our project um, as a way to uh, act on all the aspects in the system that are really uh, supporting the change that is not just a change of practice, but also a change of culture and mindset. And this is why we favor a systemic approach to develop whole system ca capacity building and change. And this is one very particular reason why the toolkit uh, target different stakeholders, the toolkit we will present to you uh, target different stakeholders. So at the same time, uh, five countries uh, have declared an interest to join a project on digital formative assessment. I will not enter into the details. You might uh, listen to it later on. Our colleague from countries will intervene today and in, in other webinars as well. But just to mention, 
uh, Finland that was at that time uh, revising the chapter of the new recently adopted curriculum and the chapter of assessment. And Finland is still for the time being, of course, working on the topic and, for example, asking the question about what are the most suitable digital tools and national criteria to support formative assessment. In Estonia, uh, a lot of digital management platforms support digital formative assessment, so there is a focus on the topic there. And for the time being, there is in particular a focus on student development and formative assessment that is uh, to take place till uh, 2013. In Portugal, uh, a recent decree um, at uh, push forward a, a push from summative to formative assessment with the development of an accompanying project, the Maya project, and also teacher capacity building action in, in parallel. And for the time being, the, the running action plan for digital transition still look at digital formative assessment. In Spain, by law, student assessment has to be continuous, formative and integrated. Uh, a lot of action concerning digital uh, professional learning, concerning specifically digital formative assessment is, is organized and, and offered to, to teachers. And the school digital plan that will be uh, fully uh, in place by 2025 will have also to consider digital formative assessment. And in Greece, um, different tools supporting DFA are available on specific platform. Recently, uh, development have addressed student assessment via skill workshop, e-portfolio, descriptive evaluation, and digital tools, uh, digital evaluation tools and teacher training on digital skills uh, are no part of uh, a concerted action. So let's now just briefly look at uh, the opportunity. So all this context makes that we, we took the opportunity of submitting a proposal under Erasmus Plus Action 3 that is really focusing on policy experimentation and under the priority of digital assessment and the call was about identifying and scaling up of best practice. So why did we focus on digital assessment in particular? So we, we noticed and we have evidence from research about the fact that assessment is really the bottleneck to innovation. We are uh, we, we quite frequently hear that a change in practice really takes scale at the moment that it can be taken into account in the assessment process. So digital assessment this time, not just assessment, um, also has the potential to, to facilitate system level change and a better integration of technology. As soon as assessment moves digital, the use of digital uh, teaching and learning practice is, is supported more easily at system level. And finally, digital formative, formative assessment. What we know from research is that when uh, it, it is considered as an intrinsic part of teaching and learning, it can really be off and offer an opportunity to reconsider learning aims, the way to assess them and very importantly, alongside summative uh, assessment. So just to clarify, in this project, we are not offering or looking at formative assessment to replace summative assessment, but really to complement summative assessment and to be used in, in different uh, contexts and for different purpose. Um, we also know that digital formative assessment has the potential to improve teaching and learning, but in specific condition, and we still need to clarify what are those conditions. We also know that nonetheless, the potential digital formative assessment is rather really used in teaching and learning. And we also have evidence from research telling us that to be introduced, it will not be through one segment change. It really need to be uh, addressed at systemic level and uh, in look at what is the change in the role of the teachers, but also the student, but also the parents, but also the school leader and the central level or intermediate level. So for this reason, we have designed this uh, assessed learning uh, toolkit. And my colleague will tell you much more about it uh, in, in a few minutes. So um, 
we started the project with a, a literature review because we needed a working definition. We have also documented the wording, the, the name that was used for digital formative assessment in the, the participating countries, so the five one I've already mentioned. And we, we needed a common definition for how to work all together in the, in the creation of the toolkit. And on top of that, we also needed to have clear review about the so many different tools that are used from quizzes to e-portfolio and adaptative uh, module, test module, for example. And uh, we have clarified all that in a literature review that is available on the website. So here you can see the uh, operational definition we've chosen and uh, that definition very much focus on the importance of the feedback. So coming from uh, what is documented through digital formative assessment tools and process provide the base to feed the feedback and that feedback has to be used by teachers to adjust their teaching but also by learners to adapt their own learning strategy and learning uh, process. So the main research question we, uh, we have identified in this project, they are still very broad and you will see that uh, later on in the results, uh, it becomes far more concrete. Uh, we had two main questions. The first one was to ask if the toolkit that we have designed during the project itself increased the adoption and the implementation, the, 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 the improved the adoption uh, of digital formative assessment in terms of kind of attitude and competencies that is needed for it to, to be implemented, but also does it improve, does the toolkit improve a purposeful use? It's not just using a, a quiz for the pleasure of using a quiz, but really in which kind of circumstances you purposefully use it, and also in terms of frequency. And importantly, this was the, the first question was very much about uh, the, the field trial themselves and the quant qu quantitative analysis, but we also wanted to understand the impact on digital formative assessment on student attitude. What does it take to them? How do they pass through it? And how does it vary depending on their sociocultural socio background? And we have been um, encountering, as everyone participating to the conference today, of course, the impact of the sanitary crisis that entered the scene uh, around the half uh, halfway of, of the project, more or less. So we, we've tried to look at it possibly as an opportunity because suddenly digital use became the only option, especially also for assessment. And we have seen several countries immediately moving tests online and so on and so forth. So it might have been an opportunity for some, but at the same time, nonetheless, this idea that when you have no other option, you will move to digital assessment, possibly formative. Uh, it was also a challenge because the question we ask ourselves, and I, I tell you immediately, we don't have an exact answer on that. But the question we ask ourselves is, is it an emergency context positive to develop real innovation? So the innovation uh, bringing to, to get, bringing also the change of culture, the change of mindset, and a real revisitation of uh, digital formative assessment. So my colleague will know, uh, tell you more. I hope that uh, uh, this short first presentation created curiosity and you would like to hear more. And I give back the floor to my colleague to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia, for setting the scene. Um, now, before we go uh, and see how uh, the rationale for the experimentation um, got translated into actually operational work, um, let's first have a look at um, the composition of the audience today. So we've asked um, in the introduction a question to you, the participants, 
um, with an invitation to uh, uh, go to the uh, www.menti.com website and enter the code that you can still see on the on the scrolling text at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's have a look at uh, the, the the results of that question. Um, I'm asking my colleagues, is it possible to put it on the screen? Thank you very much. So um, we have, at, at, at this time, we have approximately 40% uh, of the audience are teachers, 26% are teacher trainers. Uh, we also have researchers, uh, 17%. 9% of you are uh, uh, the coordinators of information and communication technologies in schools. Um, we have 4% uh, of participants that are policy makers and 4% that are uh, parents or, or guardians. So, great, thank you very much for responding to the question. Now we, we, we know a little bit better uh, the composition of the audience and I propose that we immediately jump into uh, the, the um, uh, sorry on how the the, the rationale trans got translated into uh, the the project itself so I'm now going to give you an overview of the of the policy experimentation as a whole um, and then we'll look uh, more precisely at the results so to uh, start back from uh, the last slides from, from Patricia, so we had indeed two research questions for the policy experimentation, and we explored um, these two questions with two different uh, methodologies. Um, we adopted a randomized control trial methodology for the quantitative analysis, looking at whether the systemic toolkit which we developed for the policy experimentation helped increasing uh, the adoption of digital formative assessment practices in schools, uh, including by teachers. Um, and in parallel to that, um, we had a more qualitative uh, evaluation for the research question on the impact that digital formative assessment has on the social attitudes of students. Um, and for that, we um, uh, created the, that, that vehicle called the Dialogue Labs, which I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what it is, and then we'll have an opportunity later on to really look at the results there, but also at the process of bringing people together in, in, in these Dialogue Labs. So, in the meantime, so before, before I, I go into the randomized control trial, we have another question for you. Um, and would like to ask you, according to you, which of the options below are practiced um, in schools in your uh, country? Do, stu do students create quiz questions for classmates? Do they create rubrics? Um, do they assess the assignments of classmates? Uh, and so on and so on. So you, there, are, there are various options here, and we'd like to know from you, according to you, which of these options below are already practiced in schools in your country. So to answer the question, again, you go to www.menti.com and you enter the code that is shown right now on your screen, um, in the scrolling text at the bottom of your screen. And then you enter uh, the the, uh, the response to the to the question. And then we'll see at the end of the presentation, before we go into um, the results of the field trials, we'll have a look at the uh, at, at what you've answered. Thank you. So for the field trials, we developed a toolkit already mentioned by uh, my colleague Patricia when. Uh, discussing the, the context and the rationale. We grounded the toolkit on evidence by collecting content directly from the following actors. We contacted teachers, um, we contacted teacher trainers, we were in touch with school leaders, 
We also discussed with representatives from parents' organizations. We also discussed the questions with researchers and experts. And we also uh, uh, discussed a lot with the project partners and going through the project partners to really capture uh, uh, existing practices uh, from the field, really. So what's in the toolkit? We have many things. We have awareness raising packages with texts, infographics, videos, cartoons. Um, and we have one package per target group. So we have school heads, teachers, students, parents, and policymakers. And for each of these um, uh, target group, there is an awareness raising package in the toolkit. We have teaching scenarios, each introduced by teachers. We have case studies. We have a pedagogical glossary to better understand um, and develop a common understanding of key terms uh, on digital formative assessment. We also have a compendium of digital tools. And we have a toolbox for, uh, on the theory of change to help education actors um, start to uh, change their practice and introduce digital formative assessment in schools. Now, to have more information on the toolkit and understand how the toolkit can be useful for you as an education actor, please join our last webinar, which will take place on Friday, uh, the 10th of February at 3 p.m. So the field trials. We started recruiting uh, schools in April 2001, and we asked the schools to complete um, what we call the baseline survey, so a, sur uh, a, a short survey uh, about their uh, attitudes and their current practices in terms of assessment before the field trials. We continued recruiting participants, this time teachers and students, which we started doing in October 2021. Then the field trials started at the end of November, the 1st of December uh, 2021, and they lasted until the end of April. And that was the period during which the two groups of the randomized controlled trial could access the toolkit for the test group and other educational resources for the control group. The field trials were completed at the end of April. And on the 1st of May, we started the follow-up phase with a, a post-field trials survey, looking again at their attitudes and their practices in terms of digital formative assessment to also see um, if there were any changes compared to the uh, the pre-field trials survey. Some figures for the field trials. So they lasted four months, as I uh, mentioned. Over five countries, Estonia, Finland, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. We recruited 208 participating schools, a little bit less than 900 teachers, and over 2,500 students. The schools, the teachers, and the students were divided into two groups for the randomized controlled trial, a test group and a control group. As mentioned beforehand, the test group accessed the toolkit during the field trials, and the control group accessed other resources during the field trials. Now let's have a, a look at the other strand of work which I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the dialogue labs. So as mentioned, we had country dialogue labs and student dialogue labs. Now these dialogue labs are one day workshops when they are held face to face or three hours online. And they operate as a series rather than a single workshop. So we had three country dialogue labs and two student dialogue labs during the project period, targeting the same stakeholders and with the same 
participants. So really building a community through dialogue. Now, these dialogue labs are designed to bring different stakeholders with contrasting views, even sometimes conflicting views, in a meaningful dialogue. Obviously, on digital formative assessment, the topic of our policy experimentation. And in these labs, the dialogue there is structured by reflective questions, guiding questions, which are discussed by all stakeholders. Now, this process, which um, we'll look into uh, a little bit more in the, in the next sessions, has been unanimously praised by participants. So as mentioned, we um, had a first um, instance of the Country Dialogue Lab and the Student Dialogue Lab in the period March-April 2021. 171 participants in the first Country Dialogue Lab in five countries, including 44 students, and 122 students in the first Student Dialogue Lab across the five countries. We then had a second Country Dialogue Lab in the period around January, February 2022, with 103 participants, including 31 students. We then have a third Country Dialogue Lab and a second Student Dialogue Lab to discuss the preliminary results of the experimentation. And these took place in October, November 2022, with 96 participants for the Country Dialogue Lab, including 23 students, and 64 students for the Student Dialogue Lab. So what have these stakeholders discussed? We'll see this in the next session about the Dialogue Labs, after we look at the results from the field trials. Now, before that, and just to um, continue on, on uh, what has been raised by my colleague Patricia at the end of her presentation. We also, we had a very operational impact of, of COVID-19, um, which really acted as double-edged sword, really, uh, for the digitalization of education. It, as, as Patricia underlined, it was an opportunity because everybody had to use digital tools, including for assessment. And at the same time, we were, all, we were all suddenly taken aback by this. And COVID really revealed how unprepared we were all uh, for, for, for going to school online. And when I say all, I really mean all. Uh, not only the teachers, the students, but also the parents, for instance. Operationally, uh, the COVID meant that we had to shift uh, the timing of the field trials for one year it was a bit of a challenge to recruit schools and we uh, had to turn the, the, the dialogue labs into online dialogue labs. Now, before we look at the results of the field trials, um, I propose that we first have a look at what is currently being done in schools in your country. So I will just take off my slides and I will ask uh, my colleagues to show the screen where we can see the result of uh, that question so we can see what is currently taking place in your schools in your country already. Can I ask my colleague to show the results of the question? Sorry, there seems to be a little technical issue. Okay, then I propose that we... Let's, let's have a look at the, the responses to that question a bit later on. Um, so I'm going to propose that we immediately jump into the results of the field trials. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask um, my colleague Sonia, uh, Marzadro from IRVAP to take the floor. Hello, Sonia. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. 
Many thanks, Alex. Um, good morning to all of you and a warm welcome to this first workshop for myself. Uh, just give me a second that I have some slides uh, to show you. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so the aim of this section is to provide you with an overview of the results uh, of the policy experimentation. So in the next 20 minutes, uh, I'll tell you about uh, uh, the main results. But if you have uh, any curiosity about uh, details or technical issues, uh, I encourage you to read the final impact assessment report that you will find on the, on the Assets at Learning website. Okay, so... Okay. Um, uh, before going into the discussion, I briefly want to explain what is a policy experimentation and why we did it. So a policy experimentation refers to uh, the process of testing the impact of new and innovative policy interventions in a real world setting before uh, a large scale adoption. So um, it is a specific kind of project that is designed to test and to evaluate uh, the impact uh, of a policy intervention, to gather evidence on what works. So it provides evidence-based solutions and um, promotes the adoption of policies that are scalable, effective and cost-efficient. So it is typically based on uh, rigorous research methods, uh, such as the one used here, that is um, a randomized controlled trial, that provides a measure of the impact of the intervention by comparing two groups, one uh, which had received the intervention and one which hadn't. And why uh, did we engage in a policy experimentation? Well, the answer is straightforward because it provides the most rigorous means of testing out new ideas. So as I said, uh, a policy experimentation tells us what works, uh, whether an intervention makes uh, uh, a real difference uh, for beneficiaries. It also tells us if there are groups who benefit more from the interventions. That is, if there is some heterogeneity in the impact. But there are a lot of other useful information that are generated from a policy experimentation. First, a measure of the interest of the target population for the proposed intervention, an estimate of the take-up rate. In other words, it helps us answering a question uh, like, uh, is the new intervention capable of reaching its intended target? The second kind of information deals with barriers and difficulties that can happen during the implementation and that you cannot predict beforehand. Third, policy experimentation can tell us something about the mechanisms behind the studied phenomena um, by mapping intermediate indicators, a policy experimentation can help us to understand the theory of change that explain why and how a program and intervention has an impact. And the fourth advantage is that a policy experimentation tells us whether or not uh, a specific intervention is a cost-efficient way to address uh, an objective. Right. So let's see then what was the policy problem behind the assets at learning uh, experimentation. I just want to rec briefly recall two facts that have been explained in the first section today. Uh, the first one is that there's a large consensus about the potential of formative assessment to raise student achievement uh, and self-regulating learning. However, uh, we have evidence from research telling that uh, only 58% of teachers provide written feedback, for example, and only 41% engage them in self-assessment, engage students in self-assessment. Okay? And moreover, there are also misconceptions about formative assessment, about the difference between 
assessment of learning and assessment for learning. Okay. And the second fact is that uh, there's a large consensus about the potential role of digital tools in supporting formative assessment that are largely uh, untapped. So uh, the question is, what specific interventions can effectively increase the school systemic adoption of digital formative assessment? But before going on with the presentation, I have a question for you. So what are, in your view, the main obstacles in implementing digital formative assessment in schools? So if you want, I can uh, ask you to write down three keywords. Uh, as usual, go to www.menti.com, entering the code that you can see scrolling on your screen, and then we'll see the result at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So let's move on with the policy, assets at learning policy experimentation. So to make um, digital formative assessments uh, a systemic practice in schools, the solution developed is an online system toolkit, a toolbox to support digital formative assessment in school, containing the practical guidance, uh, teaching scenarios, case studies uh, that was shown by Alex in the previous section. It was made available to all actors involved, primarily school leaders, teachers and students, according to their different needs. So the goal of the toolkit was to showcase ways in which digital formative assessment can be integrated in school teaching and learning practices and to empower students to self-direct their learning. So the broad question was, does providing school actors with this kind of toolkit increase their readiness to implement digital formative assessment? Sorry. Okay. So uh, this broad outcomes outcome to readiness to implement digital formative assessment was measured with a set of indicators that represent the causal channels uh, through which the toolkit is theoretically expected to have an impact. And you find uh, them listed here. So at the school level, the toolkit is expected to increase the school leaders' awareness and positive attitudes toward digital formative assessment and to support a school strategy for it. Um, at the teacher level, the exposure to the Access at Learning Toolkit is expected to help teachers develop uh, new competencies as well as uh, formative assessment specific knowledge. In parallel, it is also expected that treatment, uh, the toolkit, uh, increase teachers' positive attitudes toward digital formative assessment. So as a consequence of the increased awareness, attitudes and knowledge, of course, teachers should also show more frequent and more purposeful integration or uh, intention to integrate the digital formative assessment practices in their work. And finally, at the student level, the expectation was that by using the toolkit and by being exposed to teachers who use it, uh, they show more positive attitudes about their learning experience and improve their self-assessed school performance. Okay. So we can now move to the experimental setup. So we run a field trial involving lower secondary schools in five countries, Finland, and Estonia, Portugal, Spain, and Greece. We invited about 2,400 schools and 208 of them accepted to join the project. Then each school had to select one class from grade seven and at least four teachers. It's important to say that it was not possible to recover estimate 
uh, estimates by country due to the small sample size, right? And these are the final numbers of participants by country. You can see uh, school leaders, teachers, uh, and students. As I told you, uh, we ran a randomized controlled trial. So schools were randomly divided into two groups, a test or an experimental group, and a control one. We gather information through an online survey before they knew which group they were in, in order to collect background information and characteristics and views about digital formative assessment. And these also allow us to check that the randomization worked well, that is the two groups were on average equivalent in terms of a bunch of characteristics. Then we introduce a difference between these two groups as only to the treatment group was given access to the toolkit, right? We monitored uh, what and how long they look at the toolkit. And after five months, all participants were asked uh, to fill in another survey that allowed us to measure the impact of the toolkit. So given the experimental sets, the difference between the two groups was only due to the toolkit. So was the impact of the toolkit, right? And finally, the results. So first of all, let's look at the take-up rate. Uh, in the experimental group, as you can see, not everyone accepted the invitation to use the toolkit, possibly for time constraint. Uh, overall, half uh, of school leaders did it. 63% of teachers and one third of students access the toolkit at least once. I have to say that the majority of teachers did it uh, on at least two different days. Okay. While the use was more uh, sporadic among school leaders and students. Overall, the satisfaction with the toolkit was very high on a scale from uh, 0 to 10, the average rating was approximately uh, a bit higher than 7. And as you can see, feedback about the toolkit was also very positive. So, did the toolkit have an impact on the bunch of indicators measuring the school readiness to implement digital formative assessments? Uh, the findings didn't reveal any impact among school leaders and students. That is no difference between the experimental group and the control group on the different indicators. Remember awareness, attitudes, support, and for students, the experience of learning. Okay. On the contrary, some impacts were found among teachers that were also the main users of the toolkit. First, uh, the treated teachers could better distinguish formative from summative assessment practices than controlled teachers. So the toolkit had a positive effect on the objective knowledge. It reduced misconceptions about formative assessment. Mixed effects were also found on the second dimension of interest, uh, the awareness. Mixed in the sense that teachers in the treatment group declare that they know what digital formative assessment is and what it implies for teacher roles, but this effect seems to be concentrated among those teachers who started with low level of awareness, right? While on attitudes and intention to use digital formative assessment, the toolkit did not have an impact, possibly because teachers in the sample were already familiar with this approach. And because probably of the limited time frame between the treatment exposure and the data collection. Okay, so to sum up, 
these are the main lessons learned from the policy experimentation. First, the toolkit increase teacher knowledge of formative assessment. So it can be an effective way in addressing misconceptions. Second, the toolkit increase teachers awareness, but only for those starting with low level that were a minority in our sample, but a higher proportion in a general population. Third, attitudes didn't change after having access to the toolkit. Again, because participants already had pre-treatment positive attitudes, so there was less room for the toolkit to have an impact. And finally, the toolkit did not lead teachers to use digital formative assessment more. So we can speculate that the limited period of exposure on one side and the fact that this is a kind of a light touch intervention on the other side are the two main reasons of the limited effect that we found. And it is likely that such an intervention takes longer to manifest the effects, but we don't have solid evidence on this. What can be said is that the toolkit alone, even if on a systemic nature, was not enough. So linking to the question I originally asked you, so what condition are needed to make such an informational treatment a viable solution, a viable tool to encourage the uptake of new practices? What can we say? We can exclude that the leverage is a positive attitude, as in our sample, this was already high, Knowledge, we know, is a part of the story, but more is needed to increase digital formative assessment adoption. Probably other challenges, such as the availability of time, or resources, or additional supportive strategy at the school level may play a crucial role. So further investigation would be useful to get deeper understanding these challenges and uh, address them, depending on the context of teachers and schools. Uh, and as uh, colleagues already told you, in addition to the quantitative analysis, Asset Learning runs a series of dialogue labs in the five um, project countries. So these networking workshops uh, and the discussion reveal a range of needs uh, that was raised by teachers and by students regarding digital formative assessment. Some, for example, emphasize uh, uh, the value of learning communities uh, to support digital formative assessment adoption. But this is the topic of the next workshop. So I stop here and uh, I strongly encourage you to attend the next workshop to get more detail on these aspects and look at the final um, evaluation report to find more about the field trial that for time constraints um, I have briefly told you about. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia, uh, for presenting the results of the field trials. Um, there are already questions uh, in, the, in the audience, uh, but we'll save them from the, for the question and answer session uh, later on. Uh, now, what I would like to uh, do before going into the session, um, looking at the, uh, uh, the impact of digital formative assessment on students and the dialogue lab uh, uh, process, um, is to uh, look at the answers from the, the two questions that we uh, uh, asked uh, you, the audience. Uh, so the uh, the question, the first question was about the current practices uh, uh, in school, and uh, then the other question was about the uh, main obstacles. So let's have a look at the practices in school. So um, at the most, uh, uh, well, the, the practice that is mostly done, uh, according to you, in your country, is students working group and teachers observe and help a group uh, if the group needs it. Then we have teachers that give examples of good or bad work to students before the assignment. Um, and then we have teachers send written feedback 
through digital applications to students. So this already takes part to a certain extent, 14%. And equally 14%, we have uh, the practice when a student makes uh, a math error, for instance, the teacher discusses it with uh, the whole class. Okay, I propose that we now have a look uh, at the, uh, the next question, which was about the main obstacles in implementing digital formative assessment in, in schools. Um, Antoine, can I ask you to show the results on the screen of that uh, third question? Thank you. So we can see that uh, it's, a, it's a word cloud. And I can see that um, at the center of the word cloud, uh, the, the, the biggest word uh, is time, the lack of time. So this is really um, at least the, 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 the main obstacle that comes to mind uh, for, for most of you uh, when it comes to implementing digital formative assessment in school. I also see lack of uh, uh, formation, which is akin to teacher training, which we also see. I see also support and tools. Um, so the need to have more support, concrete support on how to use the different tools uh, that can help in implementing digital formative assessment. This is also something which, uh, according to you, acts uh, as, as an obstacle. And then uh, at, at more or less equal levels than other um, uh, elements, such as the reluctance to change. Uh, changing your professional practice uh, is something which is difficult to do. And whatever, whatever your, your work, whether you're teaching or, or, or whatever your profession, changing existing professional practices is not an easy thing to do. Um, but there's also, uh, uh, I can see, uh, the lack of IT material, computers for everyone. I see that on the, on the slide there. So thank you very much for uh, responding to this. Now I propose that we um, look at the social impact that digital formative assessment has on students um, and the dialogue lab process in itself. So I'm asking my colleagues, uh, so Professor Janet Elwood from Queen's University Belfast and Kay Livingstone from the University of Glasgow to come in. Thank you very much, Kay and Janet. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alex, and a welcome to everybody. Um, we are delighted to have the participants joining us and we have the opportunity to share with you some of the findings from the Dialogue Labs. Uh, Andrea, are you able to put them on to full screen so we can see them? Thank you. So what we have here is an opportunity to tell you a little more about the Dialogue Labs. My name is Kay Livingston, and as you can see, I'm from the University of Glasgow, and my colleague, Jeanette Elwood from Queen's University in Belfast. We were responsible for the qualitative side of the policy experimentation and for um, the dialogue labs. So I have an opportunity to start off this presentation by telling you a bit more about the dialogue labs following <coughs> introduction. So the dialogue lab concept had been tried before in a previous policy experimentation, but what was unique about the assess learning policy experimentation was the opportunity to have students engaging in the dialogue labs. The dialogue labs brought a whole range of stakeholders together who had either expertise or responsibility or direct engagement with either digital assessment or digital formative assessment. It was an opportunity for these stakeholders to come together to be able to share ideas about digital assessment and digital formative assessment. It was an opportunity to hear about each other's experiences and different perceptions of what formative assessment meant 
and what digital formative assessment meant, and for those who had experienced it, to share the kinds of experiences they had had, whether they be positive or negative. It was an opportunity for us within the policy experimentation to be able to hear the authentic voices of those stakeholders so that we could better understand what digital, digital assessment and digital formative assessment was like from different perspectives. It enabled us to hear about the different experiences, the different opinions and the different ideas. And as we've said, what was quite unique was the opportunity to have students involved as stakeholders alongside others over the years of the project. You've heard that we had more than one student dialogue lab. We had one at the beginning and one at the end of the process, and we had three country dialogue labs. They were set up very specifically in that way so that we could have students together, first of all, as only students within each country. It was an opportunity for us to be able to uh, hear the students' opinions when the students were gathered together, to be able to build their capacity. And our aim was that a group of students would then move from the Student Dialogue Lab and join the Country Dialogue Lab. And they would then follow each of the Country Dialogue Labs through the years of the project and then join up with their fellow students again at the end. The reason for doing that was trying to build a community of stakeholders who would start to form some trust to be able to be open and share their thoughts with each other over a period of time and deepen their own understanding of digital assessment and digital formative assessment, but also enable us to be able to collect their views throughout the whole process. Each dialogue lab happened in the country, had up to around 36 stakeholders involved. And within those stakeholders, we had 10 students. The stakeholders composed of policymakers, some school leaders, teachers, uh, some parents in some countries, researchers, teacher educators, and students themselves. So a wide range of stakeholders coming together each of those dialogue labs was very carefully supported by detailed guidelines. So the dialogue was structured. We asked them very specific questions that they then had the opportunity to discuss with one another. The questions were around what their understanding was of digital formative assessment and digital assessment, the kinds of things that they were engaging in, the experiences they had, how they understood them, and so on. We will have an opportunity to say more about these guidelines in the second webinar when we give a more detailed uh, presentation to you. The dialogue labs took place in each of the countries and so you can understand that they were half a day because they had to be online so they were three hours rather than the one day that we had originally planned. So across all of those dialogue labs we had an opportunity to collect 15 hours of dialogue, three hours for each of those across the five countries. So we're talking about 75 hours of dialogue, which gave us a, a real insight into the experiences and the practices. Each country was asked to report. There was a reporting template that allowed them to ensure that they were consistent in how we were collecting the data and we then had the opportunity to analyze it. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Jeanette, to say a bit more about this slide. Thank you, Kay. And um, I suppose this slide really just summarizes, again, what Alex had said initially, and it sort of gives you an outline of when the student dialogue labs and the country dialogue labs happened, um, who was involved, and um, how many students. I'm sorry, there seems to be a, uh, a mistake in the SDL2. It, you've got XX schools there, but it's actually, um, it's nine schools. Um, so there's nine schools there, a range of uh, boys and girls across SDL1 and SDL2. And you can sort of see there is some attrition 
there um, with 122 students in the first dialogue lab and then 64 students in the second. And that is probably normal over a period of research that happens over uh, three or four years. We were, as we said, we'd set out to have the same students go from the SDL1 into SDL2. That happened in that the students who volunteered from SDL1 to go into the country dialogue labs, one, two, and three, um, were, uh, they sort of saw it through, um, but due to circumstances and obviously sort of um, school issues taking over in terms of uh, attendance and whatever, we had a little bit of attrition. But as Kay said, we have uh, an exceptional amount of data, uh, 75 hours of, of dialogue, all of which has been transcribed and translated uh, for us. So we are, um, uh, as I say, we have a rich data set there. What we have here is uh, just a snapshot of the findings. Um, we only have 20 minutes today where, as I said, we have a much longer presentation for webinar two. So it's our aim just to give you a sense of some of our findings. Uh, we're drawing our findings from the country dialogue labs and from the student dialogue labs. And we're focusing mainly on um, some of the student voice or the other stakeholders views of the student engagement in those uh, dialogue labs. So you'll see that we have some big themes that are coming through in terms of the commonality of the views, in terms of the benefits, also in terms of the limitations and challenges of understanding formative assessment and digital formative assessment, and also some concerns. So just to share with you then some of the findings that we have. Um, the students were, were telling us about the benefits that they found. They expressed while they enjoyed digital assessment and digital formative assessment, they also had a preference for a wide range of learning and teaching approaches. So they found it motivating to engage in digital assessment and digital formative assessment, but it didn't mean that they wanted to lose face-to-face -face opportunity with their teacher in the classroom, nor did they want to lose the opportunity to engage in more traditional tests. So it wasn't an either or, it clearly was a sense that they were expressing that they wanted a range of different learning experiences rather than focusing too much on the use of digital tools. They wanted to maintain a balance of different possibilities of learning and teaching. Also in relation to digital formative assessment, they expressed the benefit of being able to understand more about the learning process, to be able to build their own awareness through digital formative assessment, of being able to understand more about where they could improve what they were doing and understanding the possibility to engage in learning. They particularly found the opportunity to engage directly with their teachers in dialogue about the learning process was helpful and being able to have the opportunity to work in collaboration with some of their students. Some found that a positive experience while others really emphasized the importance of being able to engage in feedback with their teacher. Um, impact of the COVID-19, I think as other colleagues have said already in the presentation, that we sort of um, saw the, the real outworkings of the impact of COVID-19 in terms of the increase of digital assessment and the increase of digital uh, use of formative tools in, uh, in classrooms. It sort of was born out of necessity. Um, and also that um, it was actually part of the, the, the increase in looking at students' own um, personal assessment through digital tools, but also the use of um, a wider variety of, of platforms as well. And as we'll see next, that might have created some, some problem. Some of the limitations and challenges that we find was a definite issue around the digital poverty divide and other studies have shown this um, and um, have 
emphasize that not all students and not all teachers have the wherewithal to to have uh, the right hardware, the right software. Um, and also then there's like digital, different digital resources, uh, broadband, the reliability of this and how that sort of impacts the challenges of internet crashing and also the wherewithal of students um, who um, can or cannot um, access either the hardware or the software. And we'll talk a lot more about that and how students advised us um, how they might um, deal with that. There was also coming uh, through the data, the very powerful narrative of summative assessment. Uh, I mean, we know from years of research, the sort of tensions between summative and formative and we don't actually see this as um, a dichotomy as such. And what comes out of the data is it's very much on a continuum that summative uh, through to formative is actually um, the way in which schools operate and how they need to operate. So what does the impact of digital have both on the summative and the formative and um i think that really what came out of the data seemed to be that even though formative was highlighted in schools the use of digital formative was being tried and and tested out in schools summative sort of always took over and i'll hand back to kay now I will also just tell you a little bit about the the students' views in relation to the teachers. They they were very clear that they understood the challenges that the teachers were facing. Uh, as you are aware, the, the data was collected during a challenging period with COVID. Uh, they expressed their understanding that for some teachers, they had very limited experience in digital assessment. The students were pleased to be engaging with their teachers and the sense of being able to learn to use some of these tools together. It wasn't only the sense of the limited experience around the digital aspect, it was also in relation to understanding when was the appropriate time to use certain tools and to be able to offer again that variation, that preference that the students had expressed in using different uh, sorts of teaching and learning experiences for them so in terms of their understanding of digital pedagogy that was a challenge that the students were aware of they also mentioned within different subjects that they were aware that there were possibilities to use digital tools at certain times for digital formative assessment but they weren't necessarily appropriate in all time and that really spoke about the need to try and have a whole school approach to understanding not only teachers' role, but how they can engage with students on digital formative assessment across the whole school. If we can move to the next slide. And this is just as an example. Um, at the end of the uh, Dialogue Lab, we just asked students their views on the Dialogue Lab and what they thought about it. So I think that you can see from some of the quotes here that actually um, they really enjoyed it. And the things that they enjoyed the most um, were being able to talk with and to each other, finding out that um, what other their peers, what their views were. Um, but they were also really glad that we'd asked them about their views, that they See, saw that as us caring about what they thought um, and also that it was uh, a sense that they were being listened to. Um, and then that the quote there that says, I, I hadn't really done anything like that before and maybe the sense of three hours at the beginning might seem daunting, but in the end it felt like 10 minutes and they enjoyed it very much, being able to talk with each other, talk with the facilitators, and then also knowing that there was an audience uh, for their views and their ideas. If we can move to the next slide, Jeanette. Thank you. So just to finish up our presentation, um, you heard Alex say that there was a unanimous sense of the stakeholders finding the digital 
uh, the dialogue lab approach helpful. That was expressed also by the students who said that they were very pleased to be asked to be involved and have an opportunity to uh, engage in dialogue alongside the other stakeholders. Also from those that were involved um, from the teaching side, school leaders, they expressed their sense of being able to hear the different perspectives were very important in the policy experimentation and the opportunity to not only learn more in terms of digital formative assessment and digital assessment together, but also to have an opportunity to share their views. They were able to share with each other their ideas about how to bring forward um, not only digital formative assessment in school, but how they might engage with students more effectively as they move forward. So our final question to you in terms of an interactive question, what ideas do you have about enabling greater involvement of students in developing digital formative assessment policies in school? And again, if you could uh, put one idea into the Mentimeter that's going across your screen at the moment, www.mentimeter.com and enter the code 41930928. So if you have one idea about how you think we can involve students more in developing digital formative assessment policies in school, please do that. And we'll hand back to Alex. Thank you very much, Gay. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Very sorry about these uh, technical difficulties. That's what happened. I imagine that uh, in a teaching environment, uh, this sort of things also happen. So sorry about this. Um, now is the time for uh, questions and answers. So um, you may have questions for us. We also have an, a, a question for you, as Kay and, and Jeanette just uh, mentioned. Uh, and again, please, uh, uh, go to www.menti.com, enter the code which you which you see at the bottom of your of your screen, and respond to the to the question. Now, um, questions and, and answers. We have uh, quite a lot of um, questions. There is one in particular um, from. Alejandro Falsch, sorry if, uh, sorry if, I, if I don't pronounce your, your surname correctly, uh, Alejandro, but Alejandro asked um, that question uh, in, in particular. So how, um, how can you really promote students' involvement? Um, Alejandro says that he finds it hard to uh, uh, put formative assessment in practice when students are not engaged um, and that it therefore becomes annoying to 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 try and implement it with um uh, with, with with pupils and this is also something which we saw on the uh on the the word cloud uh, uh for the question which we asked to you about what what are the main obstacles uh, for implementing digital formative assessment in school and one of that obstacle was the lack of motivation uh, uh, of students, so um, I would be uh, uh, keen to to uh, uh, hear from uh, my fellow speakers. Um, maybe Janet, uh, if you want to comment on that um, on, on on that question. Yes, I um, I think what you might be able to do is actually try and do this directly. So it's not about, um, it's working with the students to try and implement formative assessment. If, if students aren't engaged, it might be that it's actually trying to act differently. Try, rather than trying to do the same thing, is actually take as a project student involvement in formative assessment. The work that we've been doing with students um, across Europe through Assess at Learning and the other research that I've been involved in ha has tended to show that if you start from where the students are, you may have a student advisory group that you ask to work with you, you explore what some of the issues are, and then you build up from, from the ground up. 
I would recommend that. I'm not saying that it works every time, but it's also probably the same method that you would do with teacher development around formative assessment, that you're actually sharing what you think formative assessment is. You're getting a consensus to what it is. You're looking at practice already, ideas and views, and then from there, um, the bottom up, and of, often a project-based approach can, can help. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. I'm looking at the uh, chat to see if we have um, other questions or, or maybe Alejandro, if you want to react to what uh, uh, Janet has, uh, has, has, has said. Uh, I see uh, a lot of exchanges also in the, in, in, in the chat um, regarding to, to specific tools. Uh, but if you have um, additional question, Please, please don't 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 hesitate. Um, and Alejandro now now comments um, that this is uh, something that can be done uh, working working with 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 groups in in secondary education, but a little bit difficult to do um, in in primary education. Um, I'm also looking at the other speakers to see if uh, some of them want to uh, react to this. A, a point about the the tools alex if you wish yes it, from the findings we had um a whole range of tools a long long list of the things that the students said that they had been engaging in and one of the things that the students were saying is that they wished that their teachers would actually ask their opinion about the different tools because they were very aware of which tools they felt were the most helpful they were very aware about the ones that they felt worked um, and the, or they found very difficult to use, the ones that they found helpful, the ones in particular that they felt were helping their learning, were allowing them to engage in the way that they could, what tools were appropriate in which circumstances. So as the person who is experiencing the use of that tool, their main comment was, I wish the teachers would ask us more about which tools would be best um, and, and really listen to the opinions that they had. Thank you very much, Kay. I also um, encourage you to uh, come to our third webinar um, on Friday at 3 p.m., where we, we look at the toolkit and including also, as I mentioned earlier on, the compendium of digital tools we have and how some of them can be used uh, uh, in practice at different levels of, uh, of education. But of course, motivating students is, um, is, is, is certainly one, one prerequisite to, 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 to using um, such tools. Are there any other questions? I'm inviting all of you to um, ask questions or, or comment on uh, the results of the field trials or what uh, students have shared during the dialogue labs. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Alejandro. We, uh, we we welcome you to the to the third webinar and to the and to the to using the toolkit, which will be published uh, on Friday after the after the webinar. Okay, maybe it's time to have a look at um, what you responded to the question we had for you uh, uh, about um, uh, DFA in schools. Um, Antoine, can I ask you to show uh, the screen of the results? Sorry for that small delay. Okay, thank you very much, Antoine. So we can see here, so your idea is about uh, having a greater involvement of students in developing digital formative assessment policies in schools. Um, so we can, uh, uh, see here uh, the, the um, student council can create a document which will be presented to educational policy makers, a learner training, 
That's interesting. Kay and Janet, please don't don't hesitate to comment on 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 what you what you see on your screens. To I'd balance like the to priority come... of sorry, sorry, Janet, that, please go. No, it's okay. Um, it, it was just really the coming back from uh, to Alejandro is actually you can do this work with primary students. We have done it in research settings, so I'd be happy to share uh, some of those activities or how he might do that. Uh, with students and I think we have to get over this notion that we can only do it with secondary students. Primary students are very well capable of having dialogue if we facilitate and capacity build uh, with them in the same way that we would do with secondary students. So I'm happy to share some of that work. Thank you. And if, if I could just add, um, Alex, I think that when you saw the, the whole series of dialogue labs that we had uh, in our slides at the beginning, it was really important to, to recognise it's not only about giving the students the opportunity to be part of those dialogue labs. That very first student dialogue lab in terms of building the capacity for the students to be able to engage in dialogue you know how difficult it is even as an adult to feel that you can engage in a group with other stakeholders. So without building some of the capacity for the students, not only giving them the opportunity to have a voice, but also building their capacity to use that voice and to use it responsibly is an important aspect. And so it really is putting the emphasis on, we have to provide the opportunity and the training for them to be able to engage in dialogue. Thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you, Eric. Okay. Um, then we have one more question from um, uh, Sergio Sevilla, um, who asks, um, did we detect cultural difficulties for DFA in the results? So uh, are, are there, are there um, uh, cultural elements in, in in digital formative assessment, which you saw in the in the in the discussions in the in the dialogue labs, do the difficulties vary according to uh, uh, different cultural backgrounds? I think I think if I may come in there, I think that actually one of the most interesting things across the five countries was the the similarity in response. So that even from students and the country dialogue labs with adults, the patterns were going in the same direction and i think then when we got to sdl2 um and we'll talk a bit more about that uh on wednesday is actually the students themselves were surprised so we we fed back uh what we had learned from sdl1 and the students themselves were actually surprised and motivated that actually students of their peers across five countries were having similar similar benefits and similar um, challenges. Now, maybe the platforms, as Patricia identified right at the beginning, um, the platforms and some of the policy drives within the different countries might be different. But actually, the issues around, for us anyway, uh, access to hardware and software, good uh, sort of supportive elements to have good formative assessment, in, in schools and digital, that was very similar across the five countries, which was which was really uh, very informative to, to see. Just, just to add briefly, one of the interesting things was that the, the commonality across the five countries, but there were also differences within countries. So the sense, and we'll say more about this at webinar two, where they were talking about the need for a change in mindset about assessment and about digital formative assessment. But that was, again, across all five countries, the emphasis on the need to have a better understanding of what just digital formative assessment means and the relationship between digital formative assessment and summative assessment. So that wasn't something where we would, would have said that was in one country uh, and not another. It was a, a sense that that came through all of the countries when we looked at the data. Thank you very much, Kay and, and Janet. Uh, <coughs> sorry, as you can see in the in the comments, 
uh, uh, Sergio finds this amazing that different cultures and societies yet the same uh, situation, the same uh, uh, obstacles, the same uh, uh, challenges. Um, I, I, let's uh, ask. I, I see that my my colleague Sonia Marzadro from um, from from IRVAP uh, is, is 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 still with us. Uh, Sonia, in your um, uh, results in the results of the of the field trials, did you detect cultural um, uh, differences in the in the results? We were just discussing this uh, in relation to uh, the, the the dialogue labs and what students shared in the dialogue labs. Yes, Sonia. Uh, Sorry. Well. Um... We show, um, we, we have seen very little variation across countries in the indices on student outcomes. Uh, in particular, the experience with feedback practices, study motivation and uh, self-perceived performance. So very low varia variability across countries. The index uh, um, with the greatest degree of variability across countries uh, was the use of digital tools and attitudes toward digital formative assessment. But we couldn't deepen, deepen deeper so much because of the low numbers of, uh, of uh, students uh, who used the toolkit. And um, so, uh, how can I say? Uh, no evidence of any change in student experience of digital formative assessment is in line with the zero effects found on the digital formative adoption by teachers. So the lack of the effect on students, in our view, is consistent with the evidence that despite the higher knowledge of teachers, uh, there's no change in their practice, their practices. So th this is what we, we gain from, from the data that we collected. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, Okay, I uh, propose that we uh, move on. You can you can still ask questions if you want. We'll we'll we'll, we'll take uh, a last question at the at the end. Uh, but we uh, have the chance to have uh, uh, two representatives from uh, uh, country level organizations. Uh, we have uh, Jako Vuorio from the National Agency for Education in Finland, uh, and we also have. Uh, Trin Saar from uh, the, the Estonian Education and Youth Board. And I would like to ask uh, both of them uh, to comment on the, on the results and the outcomes from uh, uh, a country uh, policy perspective. Um, and I'm uh, uh, curious to, 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 to hear what the results and the outcomes mean for you in, in Finland, Jako. Hello, Alex, and nice to see you here and nice to see you all. And uh, I, I think... I will start with a short introduction uh, of to the, we're going to dive today to Finnish uh, education system and especially to our assessment uh, system. And after that, I will uh, give my comments uh, regarding the, the results. Uh, so my name is Jaakko Voria. I am the national coordinator of the Assess and Learning project here in Finland. I am currently working as a senior advisor in the Salto Digital Resource Center in the Finnish National Agency for Education. Uh, so the Finnish national core curriculum and the process of creating a curriculum is governed here in Finland by the Finnish National Agency for Education. And the national core curriculum is constructed with a large stake stakeholder presentation involving teachers, researchers, education leaders, caregivers, and so forth. So the effective curriculum uh, in the basic education is the so-called 2014 national core curriculum. And the implementation phase to all grades in the basic education was finalized in the school year of 
2020, when the last grades, grades 9 and 10, uh, implemented the new curriculum. So the, the curriculum is, is quite fresh still, although the first uh, graders uh, started to implement it on already on 2016, which is a few years ago. Uh, the introduction of the 2014 core curriculum raised international and, and also national discussion since it introduced new parad paradigmic changes introduced as so-called phenomenal learning or inquiry learning, transversal skills, but also new assessment practices as well. The 2014 core curriculum also introduced more emphasis on using ICT in learning activities but especially assessment in the new curriculum left many questions, uh, especially teachers felt there was some problems with how the assessment chapter in the core curriculum was uh, framed. I will come to this later. So in the Finnish context, the student assessment in curriculum is viewed as two-dimensional. On the other hand, the curriculum defines the principles and pedagogy of the assessment that was uh, this was something that has already raised here in this webinar and on the other hand the curriculum defines standards which are the assessment criteria for learning outcomes and the, in Finland the emphasis on is on the pedagogy of assessment and this is this is very important notion since this is something that affects and influences also the use of ICT in assessment for instance, the use of digital formative assessment tools. So in the 2014 core curriculum, the assessment chapter and the idea of assessment was not described with the most precise manner, and it was not estimated thoroughly what teachers desired from assessment norms in their working cultures. And these problems were learned immediately after the implementation of the national and local curriculums and these problems occurred, pointed out that indeed there was too much local and regional variation between assessment practices that kind of like jeopardize the equal treatment and equity among basic education students. Therefore, the Finnish National Agency for Education started a process to update the assessment chapter of the core curriculum that went into effect on early 2020, just before COVID-19 and, and distance learning. The 2020 updated assessment curriculum was warmly welcomed by teachers and practitioners and according to the trade union of education in Finland, that is the labor union of teachers, uh, the update, updated version made it clear that teachers are not expected to archive or gather material from formative assessment process compared to the 2014 original version of assessment chapter. In addition, student self and peer assessment processes were clearly declared to be non-effective to summative scores. As in every country and education systems, the curriculum defines and must define how we use, for instance, digital formative assessment. So in Finnish context, uh, the, the core curriculum and how we kind of like revisioned or updated the assessment chapter is really important notion for kind of like creating the context to to where when we come today and we are speaking about digital formative assessment so every country and every education system um, has their local and regional and national kind of like cultures in assessment that define how these technologies and how these practices are actually implemented and used so, for instance, uh, digital formative assessment tools, as we have learned here in Finland during the assessed learning project, uh, many of the tools can actually gather quite a lot of data. But according to uh, our curriculum, uh, the teachers are not expected to gather data from uh, formative assessment uh, practices. Although it's not uh, it's, it's not stated that it it's, it would wouldn't be um, it's not a bad thing, but in a way, it's something that we have to also, as policymakers, to understand that how are teachers now uh, using DFA tools since there are these options. 
So as we come back today, our next seemingly great challenge and need in the Finnish National Agency for Education, but also in, in, in broader sense in this whole society, is to continue and deepen the work with digital formative assessment that we have piloted, especially in the Assess for Learning project. The AL project has indeed started the process in the Finnish education development, where we are now moving to the new stage, where both theories and good practices are now needed more than ever. We're also happy to see the research activity in this field has started to grow in Finland and abroad at the same time as the AL project has been running. For instance, uh, just recently there was a book published in Finland about digital formative assessment and uh, it's uh, kind of like joint collaboration with our agency and the research team. There's a lot of things now moving in this field. Today, teachers are also in need for a more nuanced understanding of digital assessment and digital formative assessment that the SSF Learning Project has tried to conceptualize, uh, create resources, study and kind of like deliver practices, information and methods for teachers, uh, headmasters and students, for instance. The extensive use of artificial intelligence in education is today rapidly also influencing and changing our daily practices in assessment and learning. In Finland, uh, artificial intelligence has just recently truly started to immerse itself to the daily social fabrics and assessment practices in the Finnish education system in a growing manner. And this change has perhaps started first in the Finnish higher education, where several faculties have already given consent for students to use AI in their learning. But these faculties has also started to use AI in the assessment practices. And soon after higher education came upper secondary education and also a basic education. And today, the use of, uh, for instance, chat GPT, AI application in the education context is under a huge public and, and research debate in Finland. And I think we can all agree how important and, and crucial, yet also very surprisingly timely, this uh, Assess for Learning project is today, and especially, especially the digital toolkit that will be published quite shortly after these webinars for schools, teachers, students and headmasters to use free of charge to learn and know more about digital formative assessment practices. And this is not only in Finland, but growingly in every education system, uh, there will be a lot of new emerging technologies, new emerging questions also regarding digitalization and assessment also, because I, I think now we are seeing a lot of movement in the assessment context. As a national coordinator of the Assess Learning Project in Finland, we've seen a lot of great impact of how important the need is to continue discussion about digital formative assessment. Also, after this project ends, we witness how schools from all across, from the starting from the Arctic Circle, from Rovaniemi to Helsinki capital area, have been inspired with digital formative assessment practices and resources. Even though many of the digital tools that are have been tried and introduced in this project related to DFA are perhaps well known in Finland, the, the truly inspiring thing is that the theories, practices and knowledge resources have been scarce after before this project, perhaps even non-existence. So this project has given a lot of resources and new kind of like land where teachers can start to uh, implement digital formative assessment in their schools. In addition, our student and national dialogue labs have demonstrated us here in the agency that there is a lot of continuous need for discussions with all stakeholders involved in the school development. And this is, of course, including the student, students and as a former class teacher myself, the student's voice and involvement in the project was definitely an important aspect that gave a certain credibility for everyone that Assess and Learning Project is participatory in its nature and takes students' agency into account. Finally, uh, I think the Assess and Learning Project influenced the Finnish education development here 
at the Finnish National Agency for Education more than we actually could even imagine. You know, first came the COVID-19, where teachers were in need for digital assessment practices, resources and theories because of distance learning. And today, the artificial intelligence applications deliver again new needs for assessment practices, needs for information and, and resources. And how timely, uh, important and inspiring the assessment and learning project has been for us at the agency. And I think we are now more ready, aware and prepared to continue our work with the education development and especially assessment development to meet the needs of the future. So I conclude and thank you all for listening how we've witnessed the AL project here in Finland and how it, ha it has truly changed our agency's uh, kind of like ca capabilities and knowledge space and gave new directions for education development here in Finland. Uh, I conclude here and I thank you for the opportunity to share my insights from Finland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaco. It was very interesting to hear your perspective on uh, the, the access at, uh, at learning uh, results, but also, but also the toolkit and how useful it can be uh, for, for the different education actors. Um, I would like now to welcome uh, Trin Saar from uh, the Estonian um, Youth and Edu Education and Youth Board. Sorry, uh, Trin, how? Um, uh, what, what's, what's your take on the assess at learning uh, results and outcomes and, and the talk and how, how is it perceived from, from your country and your point of view? Hello everybody, thanks Alex for the question and uh, we will, I will talk about it uh, uh, also in my slides, so if you can put them up. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm uh, flying uh, 20 minutes to the south from uh, from uh, Jaco. So uh, welcome to Estonia. <laughs> and also in the comments, I have uh, our project partner Anna. So uh, if you have any questions, then then she can answer uh, there. But uh, let's uh, move on and. Uh, talk about, uh, uh, about the project and really shortly also uh, about, uh, about Estonia's education system. So uh, we had uh, five countries in this project and Estonia is the smallest. So you can uh, just uh, see some numbers, how many schools and uh, students and teachers we have. Uh, I'm not uh, going uh, deep with this, but uh, you can have the slides later. So so you can dig in. But uh, this project uh, focused on uh, in our uh, basic education. And uh, I will talk about that uh, more. So uh, current state in uh, Estonia, uh, our national education strategies uh, highly value uh, formative assessment. And both formative assessment and digital formative uh, digital competences are included in our national curricula. Uh, in Estonia, uh, the schools have a lot of uh, autonomy, uh, also uh, for the formative assessment. So it is uh, optional and uh, until uh, and included uh, the sixth grade. But uh, in Estonia, uh, I think most of uh, the schools have uh, formative assessment in the first and second grade. And as I said, we also have uh, some schools uh, and we are broadening the number who has uh, formative assessment also until uh, the sixth uh, grade. Uh, all the schools uh, use uh, widely um, digital management platforms. So we have two of them, eSchool and Studium, that also support the formative assessment. And there are really few schools that, that are not using them, I think mo most of them. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have really good uh, base for that. Um, I will uh, move on uh, to the project as uh, with, uh, with, with every uh, project, we have some challenges and of course, uh, positive outcomes, uh, but I will uh, uh, talk about a bit um, about the challenges. So um, I divided them into like two categories, uh, ones that were on the left side that uh, were because or with the project and uh, on the right one 
things that happen in the world so that we cannot change. Uh, as uh, stated before, uh, in the overall uh, uh, report and, uh, and results uh, within all the countries, then uh, the teachers had um, a bit lack of time to use, use the toolkit. Uh, and they stated that if they had uh, more time, maybe a whole school year, uh, then they would have more, more time to also integrate it. But, uh, but yes. Uh, then uh, the other thing with the um, project is that uh, the teacher's uh, feedback was that they would have liked to have more maybe systematical support. Um, in Estonia, unfortunately, we had a time when our agencies and project managers also a bit changed. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that uh, might have been also uh, part of the reason, but I think that the teachers are really used that if they have some regular uh, meetings or face-to-face -face or online um, classes or trainings. So that would also give some more positive effect uh, on the implementing um, part. And the um, third thing is, which is also uh, in with all countries, uh, not only Estonia, is that um, these self-study materials alone uh, is, is, is uh, maybe not enough. Uh, and um, teachers need more, uh, as I said before, to integrate it. Um, but, but these are small things. Um, what really, unfortunately, two, two big issues that uh, uh, we had on the same time that we had a assisted learning project is, of course, uh, the pandemic. Uh, teachers were quite tired already, and uh, they... Uh, had lack of time to uh, really give maybe 110% to this uh, project. And um, the other part is that uh, the use of the toolkit testing time uh, was uh, in the end of uh, December 21 uh, until the April 22. And um, in February 22, as we know, uh, the war started and affected a lot Estonia because of a lot of um, Ukrainian students came to the schools uh, and it affected a lot in their daily life uh, in, in Estonia. So that is that are these are the things that uh, affected. But uh, there are, of course, many uh, positive outcomes and uh, and uh, I will talk about them a bit also, um, <clears throat> which is uh, what is really good, of course, is that uh, our teachers already had uh, a positive attitude towards the digital formative uh, assessment. Uh, the, uh, most of them uh, knew about it uh, already, which is a good starting point. Uh, but uh, the, the main um, positive outcome is that the toolkit increased the teacher's knowledge uh, of the formative assessment. Uh, and uh, and the, overall, the project, uh, the outcomes uh, gives us uh, guidance that what we are uh, good at already now and uh, where to go next, what, what to do next, uh, what to focus on next. Uh, so, and uh, I think that these are really, really good and, and uh, effective outcomes. Um, I will... Uh, extra point out uh, the dialogue labs um, which we had in every country uh, as uh, stated before and um, uh, the discussion in school started um, of course uh, we have had uh, uh, such kind of discussions uh, before but uh, where um, all the students and different stakeholders are uh, uh, around one table um, that that was uh, really really effective, and I think that the students were appreciated uh, the most. Uh, the feedback was, was really great, and uh, they were so grateful that uh, that we listened to them and we uh, th that they were taken into account, and uh, they would really like to uh, contribute uh, in the future also in in such kinds of uh, uh, conversations. And, and of course, uh, if, um, if we talk about teachers and uh, school leaders, 
then uh, we asked some feedback and and of course uh, the the main conclusion is that there is no subject where <laughs> dfa cannot be beneficial and uh, the uh, discussions are again uh, in the in the focus uh, so here is uh, the uh, I'm just looking at the time and uh, the last uh, last slide. So what are our uh, next uh, steps? Uh, as I said, that there are currently uh, open uh, discussions uh, in the schools in the policy level about assessment and uh, especially about the learning process. And we have worked out the framework for supporting effective learning process. And we are talking about assessment and formative assessment there. Uh, what uh, we can, um, what we have to consider is how to um, include uh, students more, uh, how to carry on the dialogue labs uh, format in uh, other conversations also. And uh, we have had uh, opportunities for teachers to share their experiences, to collaborate, but we, we need to emphasize it more um, uh, in the assessment uh, field also. And um, uh, the ministry is uh, planning to implement the new national curricula with a clear scientific focus and, uh, as I said before, the student development and, and formative assessment. Um, and um, thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, if you have some questions, you can uh, leave them in, in the comments field. And if you want to know more about uh, Estonia's education or you want to visit us, <laughs> then uh, you can go to these, uh, these uh, websites and, and uh, learn more. So thank you very much and uh, for the opportunity to present here and to be part of this uh, project, of course. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you for your presentation and, uh, and thank you for participating in the project. This was also pleasure to, to work with you. It was very good to hear uh, uh, today all these different uh, results from the quantitative evaluation and the, the qualitative evaluation. There was uh, a bit of a discussion going on in the, in the, in the chat about uh, obviously uh, what, what uh, new applications such as chat GDP, GPT uh, mean for, uh, uh, for digital formative assessment practices in, in schools. Um, so it's also interesting to uh, put the, the results and the outcomes of the asset learning policy experimentation in the, in the context of this new interest, sudden interest uh, uh, on, on, on artificial intelligence and, and its use in schools. It's now time to uh, close the webinar. Um, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the discussions. We have um, another webinar coming um, uh, on Wednesday at, uh, at 2, 3 p.m., sorry, uh, Central European time. So please join us uh, then. We will be able to uh, dig a lot more into uh, the social impact that digital formative assessment has on students um, and also look at uh, the, the dialogue lab process uh, and see what it can bring to, uh, uh, to, to, to discussing an issue, really bringing uh, different stakeholders together, sometimes with conflicting voices. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to, to look at that process also um, uh, in detail. Um, I also would like to uh, let you know that uh, you can now go to the Assess at Learning website, uh, download a summary report uh, of the field trials, as well as an animation video on the uh, field trial results. We will have a specific report on the digital, on the, the impact of uh, uh, a digital formative assessment on students, which will be uh, released towards the end of the month, but we will learn more about this in the next webinar, which will take place again on Wednesday, the 8th of February at at 3 p.m. So I warmly encourage you to join us then. Thank you very much for 
your participation at the webinar today. Thank you very much for uh, the questions that you that you raised, uh, your engagement also uh, with your peers in the in the discussions in the chat. That was uh, very good to 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 watch. So again, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward very much to having you with us for our next webinar on Wednesday. Thank you.